am so delighted to be here in person. And I'll cry because that's, I'm a crier, I'm an emotional person. Um, I'm so delighted to be here in person because as I've shared with some of you, Rehoboth Beach holds a very dear place in my heart. My grandfather started fishing in Rehoboth before World War II, and when he married my grandmother after the war, he brought her here, and it was special to her because as a little girl in very landlocked Crabtree, PA, she never thought she'd live to see the ocean. And she lived to see the ocean and to come here with her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren. So it is a very special place to me. Um, the Diocese of Delaware I hold near and dear in my heart, and I thank you all from the bottom of my heart because you gave us a fantastic bishop in Pittsburgh. And we are so delighted with Ketlin Solak, and we are delighted, delighted to be working with her. So I am here today as your cheerleader for baptized ministry. And as I also shared with people, sometimes it's a little hard to find the strike zone, right, when you're giving a, a presentation. So much of what I share is really geared towards lay folks who are going through the process of discernment. If you are not a lay person, but play one on TV, if you are not a lay person, I think it's helpful to have a sense of what lay people go through, what the possibilities are, what some of the challenges are. So I hope it's helpful to you in that way. Now, in that introduction, there's all kinds of craziness. I do all kinds of things. But if you said to me, what are you? Honestly, my bio, my bio should say one word. I'm a storyteller. I think stories are gifts. The embracing evangelism curriculum that is put out by the Episcopal Church is predicated on storytelling. I think they help us share the good news. I think they help us craft our own identity. And like I said, they help us connect and be in relationship with one another. So much of what I'm gonna talk about today is myself because um, I'm an egomaniac. No, I'm a storyteller. And I hope my story can help you. So, as I said, we're, there's my family, many, many years, including meme and pops, enjoying the beach. All right. Ooh, no, I don't want to advance yet. Oh, whoa, what just happened? We got all kinds of things coming up here. Anyhow, I'm gonna ask you, all right. Ooh, I almost got ahead of myself. This is a pop quiz. I know it's early, but you're gonna do well. Who? I know there's somebody here, right? Can tell me the definition of Episcopal evangelism? Ooh, ooh. People, okay. No, I love it. What's that? Come for coffee, you know, definitely. Um, all right, here it is. This is official because it's on a magnet, all right? We seek, name, and celebrate Jesus' loving presence in the stories of all people, stories, then invite everyone to more. That is my magic word for the day, more. Because I think when we truly live into our baptismal ministry, the baptismal covenant is an invitation to more. And that was something when I was planning this, coming down here to be with you all today, that, that really struck me for the first time. I know there's a better way to advance these slides, but oh, there we go, there we go. All right, there it is. We heard that. We heard that. All right. So let's talk a little bit about more. Um, and again, in my context, I'm thinking about a vocational calling. When we talk about working for the church, I would tell you that although my paycheck doesn't come from the church, the over 90 churches and dioceses that I work with, I, I work for the church. So my baptismal ministry has blown into a full vocational calling. And not everyone can say that, and not everyone has to say that, but I think the process to talk about it is a little bit helpful. Um, and many of you, most of you I would like to think, have been in times of discernment. And do you feel, when you are in discernment, I know I do, a sense of expansive possibilities? That was always the way that I thought of it. I didn't kind of connection, but that's more, right? So expansive possibilities. About seven years ago, when I was working for St. Paul's, and I'll preface that by saying, my background is in information systems. I worked for a large oil company. Then I stepped out of the workforce to have my children. So St. Paul started for me as a mom job, right? A part-time job that I could do and be with my kids and provide them what they needed. 
but it started to grow to more. I started as a parish communicator, I picked up children's ministry, and I kept growing those jobs. And I had this sense that God was calling me to more. I loved St. Paul's, I still love St. Paul's. It's literally the only church I've ever been a member of. We joined when I was seven years old. But I knew there had to be more. What was my problem, right? I'm a lay person in the church, what was my problem? What, is, what does that look like? You know, at St. Paul's, I could grow that job as big as I want as long as I could still do it. There, there were no resources, you know, to hire me an assistant or do whatever. Diocese of Pittsburgh, it's a relatively small diocese. You know, we had like the great troubles, you know, 10 years ago, we split, there's not that many of us. So I wasn't sure, was it, was it something in the diocese? And in the meantime, in my capacity of growing more, of being called into different things, I had come across the Forma organization. That was fantastic. I like found my people. Um, I started going to workshops. I started writing for Building Faith. Um, put together a book proposal for, a, for the VBS book. All of this, things were happening. Oh, and I went to E-formation at VTS. It was all more, but again, I didn't know how to define that path. I knew it wasn't ordained ministry for me. I knew I did not have that calling because isn't that what we do with most people when they clearly have a calling for ministry? We say, you should get ordained. I knew that wasn't the case. I knew that wasn't the case. All right, onward we go. So I bumbled and stumbled. And one of the reasons I am here today sharing my story is so that the people that you serve and work with and you yourself don't bumble and stumble if you too are prone to bumbling and stumbling. One of the things that I can do is I can look back on my process and say these are some of the things that helped me move forward. I kind of analyzed my process once I came through it in the same way that I'm sure you've been doing on the calm and saying, all right, how do people get where they are? I analyzed my process. So I'm gonna share my story and then I'm going to share with you some concrete tools that I think really helped me um, move myself along, that I kind of stumbled on. Um, they helped me really live into my vocational calling and fulfill that promise of baptized ministry. So let's, let's start with the baptismal covenant. We all know this, right? So last year at Fire and Formation, when we're all on Zoom, and again, I'm so glad we're all here in person, we talked about the baptismal covenant, right? And I taught confirmation class for 14 years. And the way we approached it is we went through each of the promises. Because I said to those kids, if you're going to stand up in front of church and make promises, you better know what you're promising. And so we talked about, you know, how do we live into each one of them? Well, I know we talked about, it's an interesting exercise. Okay, I'm going to hope that we're all, we're all good on the first three of the beliefs. But when you get into the next ones, you know, the action, what are you going to do about it? Uh, the apostles teaching, resist evil, I hope we're good on that one. Um, proclaiming by word and example, seek and serve in Christ, striving for justice. Different promises speak to different people, right? Do you ever, during a baptism, when we're all asked to renew our promises and you're going through them and you're like, I got that one nailed. Well, that one I, I could do a little better on, right? Some of the promises really speak to us. And that's one of the first things I want to talk about is discernment, I think, is figuring out what is mine to do? Because not all of us are going to live into all of these promises fully. Yes, I hope we're keeping all of them. But what is mine to do? And you know, what is hard for me to do? What do I feel I should do? Should. That's, that's a loaded word. And I love Parker Palmer in the book, Let Your Life Speak, and I'm totally paraphrasing because I couldn't find this quote if my life depended on it, but it stuck with me, you know? He said, if we are saying that we should do something, usually that's actually not our ministry to do, which is interesting. What Parker Palmer says, and you can read it, but I'll read it for you because I love this quote. Our deepest calling is to grow into our authentic selfhood, whether or not it conforms to some image of who we ought to be, we should be. As we do so, we will not only find the joy that every human being seeks, 
we will also find our path of authentic service in the world. And I love that. He said, continuing on, true vocation, vocation at its deepest level is, this is something I can't not do. For reasons I'm unable to explain to anybody else, I can't tell you why I have to do this, but I know I have to do this. For reasons I am unable to explain to anyone else and don't fully understand myself, but are nonetheless compelling. And I have in my head, can you think in your head of pivot points in your life where something happened, and you probably didn't realize it at the time, right? It's only 20 years later when you're like, you know, that's where I turned hard left or hard right or a hard whatever direction. I remember going into my rector's office, Lou Hayes, and I had my little postcard for e-formation. I got it in the mail because I was on the VTS mailing list, as we all are, right? And I went in and I was like, digital ministry, they're having a conference. I need to go to this. He was like, why? Right? You know, and he's like, I don't know, you know, do we not have money in the budget? Blah, 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 blah. And I was like, no, you know, I need to do this. Now I sold him on, I'm like, well, we need a new website. You know, he was like, all right, you know, go ahead, which we did. Um, which was another time where I had a sense of a pivot point. You know, I, my background's in information systems. And when I started to try to design our website, I knew that if we did it DIY, it would be janky and I would be unhappy and I'd spend all my time, so I'm like, we need to hire somebody. Then I start talking to designers and they knew websites, but they didn't know church. And I was like, this is a debacle. Again, my non-technical rector, Lou Hayes, God love him, went to Invite Welcome Connect in Dallas. He comes back and he's like, I have the solution. And I'm like, Lou, you didn't sign a contract, did you? Who are you talking to? He's like, no, 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 this person's good. And this random guy from California that Lou Mac calls me up and says, tell me a story about your church. And I was like, oh, oh, we're gonna get along really well. That was a pivot point. That's who I work for today. You know, this is seven years later. Another pivot point, I remember being a Canuga and I had been assigned a cabin with Lisa Kimball from VTS, who I didn't know that well, and a conversation where she said to me, you need to do the leadership cohort. And I'd been thinking about it, I'd read about it, but I was taking my Girl Scouts to Switzerland, so I couldn't do it the first year, and that was a high point of my life, so that was a good call. But she said to me, you need to do this. So I can think about those, those things. Sharon Eli Pearson coming and presenting about form, and I was like, I need to do this. These are my people, right? So these things that I felt, just a compulsion that I could not explain, I didn't know why, I just know that I needed to do this, needed to be with these people, needed to find these things. So let's go back to our definition of evangelism again. I am embarrassed to admit that after 14 years of teaching confirmation, I, up until like preparing for this, thought about these prom promises, that the baptismal covenant promises, as shoulds and obligations. And it was only in preparing for you to come here today that as I shared with you earlier, I began to see them, in fact, for what they are, invitations to more, to more. Um, so, more, more, more. All right, so with that, let me share a little bit more about my story and how I found myself in discernment and, and kind of move forward with it. I told you a little bit about it. Again, I was in parish ministry doing all the things, right? And I knew there had to be more. I knew there had to be these expansive possibilities. And as I said, I started going to all the things, doing to all the things, meeting people, and I knew that my way of thinking was being transformed. I knew that seminary was not for me. I was finding my people. And so like I just meant, mentioned to you, I ended up going to E-Formation at VTS. And it was the third annual E-Formation. So again, I knew these were my, like I knew this was, this was something. And that particular year, it was like everything came to a head. My daughter was graduating. So that's the other thing let's think about. I'll throw that out there. Sometimes discernment is something we step into. Sometimes discernment is something circumstances, seasons of life push us into. So I had this season of life that was changing. 
The guy who'd been working on our website, he hadn't hired me yet, right? Because I hadn't even thought about that. I had said to him, hey, we should do a workshop for eFormation. We should do a workshop of what it means to be a client and what it means to be a web developer because people don't understand this process. This would be a great conference. So he flew from California to go to this conference. I had a meeting with John Roberto, who I'd met at a previous conference, who was like asking me to write something for his book. And I was kind of like, me? You know, it's like so when somebody waves and you're like, you waving to me? Um, so I had that. And I was a, a finalist for a job that I had long wanted, that I had really, you know, really wanted this. So we get there. Oh, and my leadership cohort, faculty, were there also. And I had to talk to them because, and, and I'm a little bit all over the place in my notes, but we're going to get there. Part of my challenge in this leadership cohort that, I, that I'd had this compulsion, I knew I had to do it, I had a nudge from Lisa Kimball, and it was fantastic. We had to do a capstone, right? And the capstone had to move you forward in your leadership. There was no set curriculum, which I think is a great analogy. You know, seminary, there's a little bit of a, there's a process, there's a curriculum. For lay folks, like, there's no set curriculum. So we were in a cohort, and your capstone had to be something that moved your leadership forward. And I had done the things. You know, I'll, I was presenting workshops. I'll tap dance in front of 300 people. I don't care. You know, that didn't move my leadership forward. Um, you know, people were like designing policies, designing curriculums, great. Um, you know, I had a book proposal in for the VBS book, and I was like, yeah, that, that's, that's not moving my leadership forward. And my academic advisor at the time kept saying to me, Lisa, you need to focus. Well, you can imagine, you know, how well that went over. <laughs> and I was like, no. I said, here's where I'm at. I'm like, you know those pinatas, not the ones you hit with a stick, but the pinatas that have a million strings? I said, I feel like I hit, have to keep pulling the string until I get the one with the candy. I haven't gotten the one with the candy yet. I don't know what I'm going to do. And you know, we're pushing the kind of end of the program year, and I don't have a capstone, much less loan, you know, the 20 page paper that has to accompany it. I'm like, all right, what am I going to do? So I go to eFormation, and ooh, where's my slide? I think I have a slide of this. Is that it? Oh, there's eFormation. There we are. There we are. Aha. I go to this workshop, because it sounded interesting, and they talk about a journey map. And I'm so excited I still had a slide of this. I found this in my phone from, you know, all the way back then. A visual way to describe the relationship between a system and the people using the system. I'm, an, I, I'm a programmer at heart in, so, in addition to being a storyteller, so this made sense to me. Now here's the funny thing, and this is a little bit of a sidebar. The school that I went to, I went to Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, and their computer science department is the math department, they're high tech. Information systems, which was my major, when they started that program, math department didn't want it. They're like, nah, that's the soft stuff. Humanities was like, we'll take it, because they knew it was going to be a money maker. I was in this tech program, how to use technology in the humanities. Gee, doesn't that sound like what I do? I am like the only person that does exactly what I went to school for. Oh, and I double majored in public policy. Did I mention I'm a deputy for general convention? So all my like weirdo passions kind of made sense. So I see this, and all of a sudden my capstone becomes clear. I said, I am going to create a journey map how I got here. I have no idea what I'm doing next, but I'm going to make a journey map, and that's going to help me. And I remember I was walking in a parking lot at VTS at like 5.30 in the morning going through all this, and I began to lay it out. And I laid out a timeline of those things, those pivot points where I was like, ooh, I did this thing, and this happened, and I wrote this article, and I went to this workshop. And then I started laying people over it. Here's where I met Lisa Kimball. Oh, here's where I met Meryl. Here's where I met so-and-so. Here's where I met so-and-so. And I started connecting the dots. Let's see, do I have my, my crazy process map up here? I think I do. I think it's the next slide. It is. So aside from that, you know in the movies when they like find the like serial killer's lair and they have those crazy bits of newspaper and arrows and all that? It's a, it's a little bit that. I recognize that. 
but it made sense to me. And here's what I gleaned from it. It did not give me the next steps. This, amazingly enough, you'll see there are a lot of arrows. You know, there's still a lot of pinata strings hanging. But it showed me, I felt clearly, where the energy was and the presence of the Holy Spirit. In this, I saw where the Holy Spirit had moved through my life. And buoyed up by that knowledge, I felt confident of the next steps. I felt that expansive possibility. I was ready for the more. I wrote a little bit for John Roberto, didn't really follow up with that. I removed myself from the interview process for that job that I wanted. I realized that, that wasn't where the energy was. And sitting next to my now business partner at VTS, I literally like nudged him in the shins and I said, you should hire me. Now he's a Southern California tech guy. And I said, do you know how little money I make in the church? Like these are not Southern California numbers. I said, you can't afford not to hire me. And I told him how much I made and he said, you're right. And my husband was like, could you not have told him five grand more? And I was like, mm, you know, I'm not a good liar, you know. So that's kind of how I got started doing what I'm doing. And those connections, those encounters, that energy, it's all come back to fruition again this summer in, in ways that I cannot announce yet. Let's just say we're coming alongside of another company and I'm really excited that that goes back to a lot of this. So that's kind of my story. And I tell you my crazy story and show you my crazy process map because again, in retrospect, my capstone, which I did finish and I wrote about it, um, actually really helped me dissect how did I get through this journey of discernment? How did I fully live into a baptismal life, a vocational calling? So let's review a couple things, and I hope these help you. One, we talked about this idea of what is mine to do, what baptismal covenant promise speaks to me, what is it I can't help doing? I'm gonna do it regardless. No matter what anybody says, I can't help myself. Can't stop. Second, what I think is interesting is when we talk about discernment, like what am I going to do next? What is God calling me to do next? And we're looking forward, and we're looking forward, and we're looking forward. But the clarity I needed could only be identified if I looked back. I had to go and say, Where was the Holy Spirit? What brought me here? And I think that is a really, really important and perhaps neglected step, I think especially for lay people. Um, You know, going through an ordination process, there are steps, and we can say, okay, their paperwork's in order, they've moved on to the next step, you know, or whatever. But I think for lay people, it's this, where is God, oh, geez, where is God calling me next? So I think that's really an important thing to acknowledge and look for ways in my past that I've been nudged forward. What are those pivot points where something happened? And I can't explain it and I don't know why, but boy, 10 years later, I still remember that moment. So I think that's important. Three, find your people. I think another misperception of discernment, you know, we're like, we're gonna be like Jesus 40 days in the wilderness. I'm going to go into the wilderness and God is going to speak to me and like Moses, I will hide my face and remove my shoes. I don't think that's how it works. We need our people. We have to discern in community. My cohort, um, we had a phrase, name it and claim it. We had these, and it happened to be all women, but whatever. Um, that were just phenomenal leaders, but none of us had a seminary degree. None of us had what you would call a legitimized knowledge base, but we had experiential knowledge, and we had lived it, and so that was part of our leadership cohort, was to name it and claim it. And here's the other thing I realized retroactively, is all of us were in discernment. We thought we were doing leadership, but it was really discernment. The other thing about finding your people 
and again, this leadership cohort embodied that, was there has to be some structure in the relationship. I mean, we all know, like, you know, it's 0.2 degrees of separation for every Episcopalian in the United States. If simply knowing Episcopalians led to clarity, I mean, my life would be laid out, okay? <laughs> there has to be some structure in these relationships. There has to be some intentionality around discernment. My cohort held me to my best self. And this summer, when the discernment process reared its head again, that I did not know which way things would go, at one point in time, I contacted them and I said, I need a like, discernment committee. And they listened. Um, it was interesting, the structure we followed, and we, we learned this in our leadership cohort, was I gave them the whole story, you know, and whether that was 10 minutes or whatever long it took, then they had time to ask clarifying questions, which I answered, and then I shut up and listened. And they told me what they heard and saw in my story. And, oh, wow, wait, that's, that's, that's our evangelism definition again, right? Jesus' presence in my story. So random encounters are important. They're on my journey map. But when it is time for true discernment, I think you need your people, and I think you need to have some structure. And we're going to talk about some ways we can structure those. Fourth, always, grounded in scripture. I think this is such a helpful exercise. This is another thing we did as a leadership cohort. We talked about embedded theology. Now, many of you have gone to seminary. I'm sure you've worked through some of this. I don't know. I've not gone to seminary. And the way it was presented to me was, what at your core essential being do you believe God to be? Do you believe about God? And what scripture expresses that? I mean, if nothing else, this is an unshakable part of who you are. And you saw in my process map, and the funny thing is, like, again, like, I, I, can, never, I can never tell you, so this book of the Bible and this verse, I just have a sense of it, which again tells you how embedded it is. And it's that piece of scripture, I think it's Corinthians, <laughs> um, neither highs nor lows, nor angels nor demons, nor this nor that, but none of the extremes can separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm also a little embarrassed to admit to you when that particular verse was first really illuminated for me. I mean, obviously, I'd heard it. Did any of you ever watch Deadwood? <laughs> okay. All right. Violent show on HBO, you know. Um, and there is a priest on there. And unlike many religious figures on many shows, he was truly a good human being and was not a character for mockery or to you know, show hypocrisy. Like, I love this character. And ultimately, he is dying of what we know to be a brain tumor. And he is standing in the mud, and he is preaching that verse to an audience of cows. And like the glory of God is shining through him. And somehow that scene opened that verse up for me in ways that it had not before. And I think in further reflection, in my capstone paper, thinking about the extremes. I'm a contemplative. I would tell you that I am able to hold multiple truths in tension at the same time. You know, so again, walking through, one of my other favorites is the one about, you know, we see but through a mirror darkly. Again, I'm, I'm okay with uncertainty. My third one is, arise, my love, my fair one, and come away, you know, from Song of Solomon. And yes, I used it in my wedding. That's a positive association, but why? It's about passion. Fire, and you know, water cannot quench fire. And again, I'm paraphrasing horribly, but I feel the passion in that. I'm not a shrinking violet. I have a lot of passion for what I do. So, you know, those naming and exploring those scriptural verses, my embedded theology, what do I truly believe, really helped me, again, have this sense of what am I, dis you know, I'm not going to discern sitting behind a desk. You know, there's a lot of passion in what I do. So, those are the big four. Know which baptismal promise you are living into, you have to live into. Look backwards, where have you been? Find your people and be intentional about it, grounded in scripture. So a few more practical tools to help you do that. Um, one of the items that I love 
And this had uh, its genesis during that particular leadership cohort that I was a part of. Some of you may have used, especially if you're a deacon, there's like a deacon competencies grid, and I don't know if they call it a competencies grid, but it's a grid. And I think it comes out of the Church of England, and really it's a spiritual assessment tool. And so a cohort of folks put together a Christian life of faith, signs and thresholds along the way. It's a mouthful. What it really is, is a spiritual assessment tool. And what I really like about it is just like the baptismal promises, some characteristics of spiritual growth, we are like full on living into, and others are like, yeah, that one, not so much, got to work on that. So it is not a linear progression. It's not a curriculum, you know, the 100, 200, 300, 500 level course. It is a grid. This is available online. Um, I think we're, we can print some of these out. You can find it online. It's a great tool to use in your individual assessment of your spiritual growth, characteristics of spiritual growth, but then it becomes fodder for conversation with your cohort of people. Speaking of your cohort of people, I really, really love the concept of Quaker Clearness Committees. And if you get, I pulled this up from, I have the website, talk to me, I'll send you the website. Um, I love, wait, there's a quote here. I have my quote, I have my quote, we're gonna get there. Under my Christian life and faith. Ah, here we go, here we go. I love my quote. Although this process represents a set of linear steps, the reality is that the spirit usually does not move in a linear fashion. We all saw my journey map, sure doesn't. While there is no way for us to predict or perfectly map the movement of the spirit in an individual's life, this is a general process for how one might engage in being faithful to leading a ministry. Now, there's a lot of Quaker language about Quaker meetings, and, and that's the other thing I like. The, queer, the Clearness Committee helps look at discernment in the context of a community. So maybe what is yours to do, maybe is not yours to do in this community. Maybe that's part of your discernment. Um, so I think Clearness Committees are super helpful. Um, another thing that I like, when they talk about clarity, what does that mean? Is it grounded in the spirit? What is the nature of the call? What are the ways in which this person feels clear? Um, oh, oh, there's more of these. Uh, lack of clarity. Well, we'll just, we'll, okay. <laughs> so clearness committees, love those. Now, if you said, gee, I wish the Episcopal Church had something like that, funny, you should ask. Um, I have not gone deep with this resource yet, um, but when I see discipleship groups, and I think disciple and discernment, I do not know Latin, but I gotta say those are the same root word. So I'm thinking that again, this is a structured group, pro, you know, a way to structure group conversations, it involves a rule of life, that could be adapted to discernment groups with that particular focus. So I think there's a lot of resources out there. One thing I want to leave you with, and I want to make sure I get my quote. See, I brought all the papers and the clippies. Da, da, da. Here's my quote. All right. Once again, I want to go back to my pinata analogy. The other analogy that I used a lot during that time of discernment is that I kept saying, I feel like I'm swimming in a churning sea. I know I'm gonna wash up on a beach, I just have no idea what beach. I was hoping for Grand Cayman, but here we are. <laughs> during that time, my entire prayer every day, every morning and every night was this. Let me be that which I am intended to be let me be content with it. Now, that doesn't sound like more. Discernment is hard stuff, and it can take a long time. And when you're in it, it can be very, very, very hard. And I think, I don't want to say especially for lay people, but you know, part of the challenge, again, for lay people is there's just not that clear path. 
And that's really hard in that moment where you once felt expansive possibility, there's a sense of like, come on already. Like, can we just, can we get somewhere? And this summer, again, while I was experiencing that again, um, somebody posted this on Instagram, Jackie Lewis, who I don't know, but I, I liked this. Right where you are, right where you are in the hurt and sorrow, that's right where the insight is, that's where the answer is, that's where the wisdom is. The transformation is there. The rebirth is there. You're not alone. Your friend, your lover, your family, your helper, your cohort, someone from your posse will midwife it with you. Love that phrase. The healing will come and you will emerge shaped in the merciful womb of the fiercest love. The pain of birth is excruciating, but someone who loves you knows how to reach in and grab you and hold on to you until you make it through. You'll emerge lighter, less encumbered, ready for new stories, and transformed by old ones. That spoke to me. And so that's what I think you are being invited to do here today. To find those cohorts of people so that you can find your way to more, you can all find your way to more, right? Now there's one more promise from the baptismal covenant that we didn't talk about, but actually that's exactly where I wanna leave, or leave you with today. I wanna end with today. Because this is the promise that we're making for one another. Will you, who witness these vows, do all in your power to support these persons in their life in Christ? And we all answer, we will.